Hello, world of James Bond. This is Jeremy Pate back at it again with another video. Now about, sorry, let me adjust this here. About seven months ago, I posted the 25 James Bond films that I've ranked. And I'll probably put the link in the description so you can see how much my opinion on the films have changed over the years. So, at number 25, here goes, A View to a Kill. Now, A View to a Kill, let me adjust this again. Okay. Now, A View to a Kill, um, to me, is the worst of the franchise because Sir Roger Moore was way past his prime. And I'm okay with having an older James Bond, but the story itself didn't fit in with his age. And also, on there were some god-awful moments when you can clearly see that it's a stunt double um, on those scenes, which isn't supposed to happen. And... The women were a lot younger than him as well. So for me, it just didn't work out. It probably would have been a much better movie if Dalton or Brosnan or somebody else had stepped in at the time instead of Roger Moore. He did his best though, but um, to me it was just a very mediocre Bond movie. I can still enjoy it at times, but it's probably the least enjoyable to me. At number 24 is Diamonds Are Forever. Um, this is one that, you know, yes, it's funny. Yes, I can enjoy it a little bit, but um, Sean Connery... I mean, he's he's overweight, he's out of shape, he's a lot older in the face. He really doesn't look like a James Bond at that point. And the story, let's just admit it, the story was kind of stupid, the plot. But having said that, it's enjoyable. It's I, I watch it and see it as a comedy. You know, I can still sit back and have my popcorn and my pretzels and and enjoy the the movie as it is. But you know, it's just the quality of the movie isn't the best. At number twenty three I have The World Is Not Enough. After the pre title sequence, which is absolutely fantastic. Once after the the titles, um, the title song, the movie it's kind of boring, and you know Renard, and I'll still say it. I still say Renard was not a good villain. <clears throat> he was a weak villain, and it should have been, you know, with with. Uh, Someone who get gets shot in the head and that bullet just makes him stronger and he can't feel pain and and you know <clears throat> someone like that and he doesn't have much time to live that's a pretty cool present uh, <clears throat> that's a pretty cool uh thing but Robert. Carlisle, his character didn't deliver. And, yeah, they talked about it once. You know, about the bullet lodged in his brain and can't feel pain and all that. But someone like that should be a more dominant character. It should be, you know, a muscle-bound muscle guy like 
like a Arnold Schwarzenegger or or you know like a a mafia type guy um now Sophia Marceau I thought she was good but I mean I've I've heard that people like the score I thought the the score of the movie was was kind of slow and and dull um so what I like about The World's Not Enough is everything in the pre-title sequence. Everything after is kind of subjective. There's good moments and then there's moments where I felt it really didn't hit the mark. So that's my thoughts on The World's Not Enough. Now, You Only Live Twice, I got it number 22. It's another one of the weaker Connery Bonds uh, you can clearly tell that he wants out. And you can see it in his eyes throughout the film. And the stuff about him becoming Japanese, it's not a good look. And there's just a lot of dumb stuff in there. But what saves the film for me is Donald Pleasance as Blofeld. He was fantastic, and everything with with Blofeld's lair, um, all that stuff in the third act, to me, is what saved the movie. Now, at number 21, I have Honor Majesty's Secret Service. It's had a renaissance over the past couple years. Now people are saying it's their favorite, top five. To me, it's still one of the weaker Bond movies. Now, yes, on my last ranking, I had it all the way up to number six, but my opinions have, have changed on it. Uh, George Lazenby is obviously the worst Bond. Probably could have been better if he had a couple more films to improve upon, um, but to me, it's it's just okay. It's an okay movie. I'm not gonna feed into the hype that it's this amazing Bond movie. To me, it, it's okay. You can enjoy it. We're all open to our opinions, and that's my opinion. So at number twenty. I have The Man with the Golden Gun. Um, the stuff when um, Roger Moore was being rough with Maude Adams' character, uh, to me it didn't work for him as Bond. And most of the movie was kind of tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't the writing wasn't fantastic. Uh, I thought it was kind of a dumb scene when Mont Adams comes in and then he takes uh, Mary Goodnight and then hides her in the closet while he's sleeping with another girl. I mean, you could have come up with something much better than that. Um, now, Christopher Lee's great, and I liked all the stuff between him and Bond, but it's one of the weaker Bond movies, uh, one of Roger Moore's weaker Bond movies, so that's why I have it here. At number 19, might be a shocker, might not. This is one of those where some, some of the fans have it high up there and then some people just can't get into it. I'm one of those people where it's back and forth. As you look at my last video, I had it, I think, all the way at number four, but now I have it at number 19, and that is Thunderball. Um, it, it can be hard to get into it at times. I think it's one of those you have to be in the right frame of mind to see it. Because it can be a little boring with 
the slow pacing of the movie and you just you know want it want it to pick up a little bit um other than that it's it's pretty good so thunderball number 19 at number 18 quantum of solace this is one where you know a lot of people have it on the lower tier I can enjoy it for what it is. It's a direct sequel to Casino Royale. Uh, the action's really good. Um, it's just the pacing and the shaky cam might have been a little too fast. You want to see that action be a little more polished. But other than that, I say I enjoyed it. At number 17, Spectre. Uh, Spectre, it's, it's generic in a way, but I like Christoph Waltz's Blofeld. I like, uh, Craig's performance. I liked, uh, M. So, I, I say it was pretty good. At number 16, I have... Octopussy, um, it's too out of touch with reality, it's very, very campy, very silly, but what I love about it is all the Cold War stuff and, and General Gogol, and when Bond shoots one of the twins and he says, that's for 009, uh, Roger Moore gives an awesome performance. And this is, you know, like with my argument with A View to a Kill, when I said that I'm okay with an older Bond if you have the story centered around that. And they did an excellent job with this one because you brought Maude Adams back to play the role of Octopussy and she was kind of similar age to to Moore, and I felt like it it really worked out, and I think that should have been his last uh, outing in the role. At number fifteen, I have the Living Daylights. The score is fantastic, and. I like uh, Mariam Dabo. I like, you know, Dalton in the role. I like his more sinister, snarky, ruthless kind of take on it, on the, the character. And it was very similar to Bond in the novels. So what... The reason why I have this in number 15 was because... The villains were weak, and the middle act, after they escape from the Russian prison, is very draggy, slow pace, which you can have slow pace, but when something is so prolongated and unnecessary... You know, all the scenes when they're in the the desert, you know, that could have been either sped up a bit. Uh, most of all that stuff could have been scrapped. So that's why I have it at number 15 here. Number 14, I have something that, you know, is very beloved. Um, with the Bond fans and, and also casual fans. Number 14, I have The Spy Who Loved Me. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Barbara, Barbara Bach is, is fantastic. Um, they really play to Roger Moore's strengths. Um, it's just one of those where, I don't know, it's kind of like a Bond by numbers kind of thing. It's like, great scene, great scene, you know. It's just kind of all played sort of one way. And, 
which isn't bad. I just like to see a little more conflict and twists and turns. So that's why I have The Spy Who Loved Me at number 14. And number 13 I have From Russia With Love. Um, it's one of those sort of like with Thunderball where I have to be in the right frame of mind to watch it. Um, but Robert Shaw's fantastic as the henchman. Uh, I like Rosa Klebb. Um, I like, you know, Bond himself. And I like, um, his, you know, I like his allies, the people that he works with. I like the premise and the story. So there's not really much that I dislike about it. It's just more of that slow pace and I prefer kind of a faster pace to my Bond movies and movies I watch in general. So that's why I have From Russia With Love at 13. Number 12, I have Skyfall. Um, it's great. Uh, Silva is an awesome villain. Um, it's very stunning to look at. Um, with Roger Deakins doing the director of photography. Uh, Sam Mendes, first directorial Bond debut with Skyfall. And it's good. So all, that's all I have to say. It's good. Um, but if I compare it to what I have in my top 11, top 10 of what I like to watch in James Bond... That's why I have Skyfall here. So it's good, if not great. But I like some of the others better. Number 11 is For Your Eyes Only. Uh, Roger Moore was great in this. I liked how he showed more of his serious side. The story was good. Um, I liked just about everything about it. Um, I just like others better. At number 10, I have No Time to Die, the most recent Bond film. And, you know, some of the stuff I, I didn't like about it with the, the Nomi character. I wasn't really that big of a fan of hers, but the action was probably the best action that we've seen out of, out of a Bond film picture. I just think No Time to Die might have been too long. Uh, you could have shortened some things out and maybe polished uh, Remy Malek's villain a little better. But other than that, it's an enjoyable movie and I'm, I'm okay with the ending of it because it's the end of Craig's carnation of Bond. And we know that Bond will return and Bond's going to be rebooted. So I think it's cool having Craig's Bond be in its own section. So No Time to Die, uh, pretty darn good, pretty darn good. At number eight, I have Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, I love Elliot Carver. I love Michelle Yeoh. She kicks ass. And this is the Bond that I like. This is the fast-paced action. Tons of fun thrown into it. And you can tell Brosnan's having fun. Everyone's having a good time. And it's just one of those very enjoyable movies. And the premise of the plot was ahead of its time. Because now you're seeing a lot of corruption with the media in, in today. So that's what I like about Tomorrow Never Dies. At number seven, I have Moonraker. Moonraker, it has its flaws. Roger Moore was probably a bit too misogynistic. And the scene when... Uh, the girl runs away from the villain when he sends his dogs after her. She had her golf cart right behind her. She could have just 
escape that way. Instead, she runs. So things like that, just little things that I have issues with. But what I love about it is when it gets to Moonraker 5 um, going up into space and then Vaughn noticing what's going on here. He's like, they came in two by two, Noah's Ark. And, and the villain's plot was pretty cool with him wanting to have his own master race and have them procreate in space, pretty much just des destroy Earth and start a whole new race. That was a kind of intense and a, and a bold move for a Bond film, especially in something that's more campy and silly like Moonraker. So even though Moonraker, people say, is a little too campy, I actually like it better than The Spy Who Loved Me. And Moonraker has that blend of campy and serious. And you, you have to realize this is in Bond's universe. This isn't in the real universe. So they, they really played to that. Um, at number six, this is something where a lot of the Bond community craps on but this is a sentimental movie because this is the first movie that I remember watching as a child and this is probably my most watched Bond movie and that's Die Another Day. I, I recognize its flaws, I recognize the overuse of CGI, I recognize the kite surfing scene off of the tsunami didn't need to be in there. I recognize the invisible car is hard to believe. But like my argument with Moonraker is, you're in Bond's world. So they kind of just wanted to do something new there. And the action is awesome. The dialogue is fun. And you can just sit back and watch... A, a fun Bond movie. So, Die Another Day is at number six for me. At number five, I have Golden Eye, which is the best of the Brazen era. It's very grounded, and even though it was 1995, and at the time it was post Cold War, it was kind of another one of those Cold War action thrillers. And the dialogue is, is very witty, very intelligent. Um, I like the bold move of casting Dame Judi Dench as M. And I like the new characters it introduced. I like Jack Wade. I like Valentin Zakovsky. Um, I like Money Penny. And. I liked the Bond girl, I liked the main Bond girl, and I also liked um, the villain, the henchwoman. So, Golden Eyes, it's, it's a load of fun, but it's, it has that seriousness involved that gets you intrigued to watch it. That's number five. And number four, I have Dr. No. It's, it's the first. It's classic. Um, when you see Ursula Andres uh, walk out of the water with her bikini and, and the knife uh, latched on to her hip. And she's just downright gorgeous. And you see Connery say, no, I'm, I'm just looking. That, that is awesome stuff. And then in the beginning when uh, Bond argues about losing his Beretta to have the uh, Walter PPK, that stuff's awesome. 
and Felix Leiter's is fantastic. And yeah, it's it's a kind of a low budget movie and it's the startup, but the, the dialogue, the story, uh Conry is really leading the movie here and establishing himself as Bond. So for me, Dr. No has to be up there. So I got it at number four. At number three, I have License to Kill. Uh, Dalton is fantastic in this. Dalton leads throughout the movie. The movie is, is charactered to fit his, his role. I liked um, the whole uh, shark kill um, that happened to Felix Leiter that he ended up surviving and that was uh, something take, taken out of the Live and Let Die novel. Um, I love Fran Sanchez. He's my second favorite villain to Raul Silva and Skyfall. Uh, Talisa Soto's great as Lupi. Um, and I like uh, Pam Bouvier. She kicks ass. And I like the whole, th you know, the plot about the Colombian drug lord and all that stuff. So, License to Kills at number three for me. Now, at number two, I have Goldfinger. And I'm going to point something out here because there's people in the Bond community that are saying, well, you must just be a casual fan if you just have Goldfinger at, at your top, you know, number one choice or something like that. And I think that's stupid. I think... You can have whatever opinion you want to have. It's it's James Bond. It's it's for the viewer. And for me, Goldfinger's at number two. Uh, Sean Connery is awesome. Goldfinger is awesome. That scene when the laser is about to take take his balls out and the suspense there is pretty great. And then. You know, the whole, that scene alone with the laser is the best scene in the whole franchise. And, you know, that that single line of, of Bond saying, so you expect me to talk? And, and Goldfinger saying, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Like, that is is awesome. The reason why it's not at my number one is because it's not really in reality. You're not going to steal gold from Fort Knox as easily as they did in the movie. And with Goldfinger hijacking the president's plane so easily, that's not going to happen in real life. But it's still one that... It's awesome, it's enjoyable. Um, the Aston Martin, the ejector seat, all of the tropes that establish the formula for the Bond films today, it, it all started here in Goldfinger. So, Goldfinger at number two. Number one, Casino Royale. Because it's a modern take on the first novel, um... Casino Royale, and the dialogue is very um, intelligent, and, you know, you feel the emotion of the characters and the story, um, especially um, outside of the casino in Montenegro, when... Um, Bond is talking to, um, to Vesper Lind, and, and, and she says, I'm sorry, you know, I can't give you that extra five million to help you win this high stakes poker game. And Bond is, Bond is just riveted. He's livid. He's like, sorry, sorry that. This guy is is 
going to fund terror and and cause harm to the world that that kind of sorry and and like you feel the emotion there that and bond he's like i know i can beat this man and then the torture scene and and having read the novel um it's it's very similar and then the the last line of the book that he says toward the end of the movie of of um the bitch is dead i mean that's very bold and very awesome and and we're talking about a guy myself that i never played poker i still don't really understand the game but yet i'm i'm there i'm i'm in it i'm watching it and in this movie you you kind of feel like you are james bond and you you feel like you're seeing things through through bond's lens and so yeah to me casino royale is hands down number one so here's my recap 25 of you to kill 24 diamonds are forever 23 the world's not enough 22 you only live twice 21 honor majesty's secret service 20 the man with the golden gun 19 thunderball 18 quantum of solace 17 specter 16 octopussy 15 the living daylights 14 the spy who loved me 13 from russia will love 12 skyfall 11 for your eyes only 10 no time to die 9 live and let die 8 tomorrow never dies 7 moonraker six die another day five golden eye four doctor no three license to kill two goldfinger and one casino royale thank you very much for watching this video please like share and subscribe